Welcome to IDF TV. My name is Frank Infuse and I'm from the Oracle J Developer and IDF Product Management Team. In this recording, which is the last out of four that we do on security, I want to summarize what we've said so far and provide a list of best practices for you to address the OWSP top 10 vulnerabilities. Now, the Open Web Application Security Project lists the top 10, by their experience, the top 10 security risks that they found for a specific year in a separate document that customers are well aware of. And a lot of our partners and developers are questions like, how in ADF can I address the top 10? So before starting with that, let me make clear, and I make this clear in the first recording as well, where we talked about this list, the top 10 doesn't mean that there isn't a top 100. Yeah, so be aware that Fixing the top 10 doesn't make you a play, having a secure application. Anyway, it helps. So let's go over the list. So we do have different risks as identified by OWSP. So we have SQL injection, cross-site scripting, where try, people try to execute their JavaScript in your con application context, authentication, mismanagement. I talked about this in the last recording as well. Insecure redirects or directs as well. So directs, for instance, to objects like a report where I could guess the sequence number which makes the naming pattern for a specific document and then I try, try and start guessing other people's document. Secure misconfiguration, well, security misconfiguration, that would be like switching off security for testing and then forget to enable it back when you put an application to production. Field transport layer security, uh, which is typically HTTPS that you use, or unvalidated redirects, which is where you redirect to an application like mimicking single sign on and I talked about this in the last recording, and just based on a token that you send with a request, you make the assumption that only because the token is there, the request is valid. Now, this is the top 10 just in brief, and if you want to get the full story on this, just go back to the first recording just in case you haven't seen it. Now, let's see how we can address this in Oracle IDF. Well, first of all, ADF Business Components, if you use that as a business service, is well integrated with ADF Security. And I mentioned this in the third recording as well. Now, what you can do is you can specify permission-based security on the entity object and on the attribute. On the attribute, you can mark if it's updatable or not by the authenticated user. But on the entity, you have more options. You can also control the delete and the update on the entity. And they do this declaratively. And then on the user interface, we render the component as read-only if you don't have update privileges. And we do this even if the component that is used to build the user interface is an editable component like an input text field. So this way you have a visual representation as well. The ADF controller, and we talked about this, protects bounded task flows or has bounded task flows protected by ADF security. So as soon as you have security enabled, bounded task flows require authorization and they require a user to have the permission granted to access the bounded task flow. However, every view within the bounded task flow is always protected with the permission of the task flow, which means that if you need to have finer grained security, then either take one of the views into its own bounded task flow and protect it there, or just enforce it manually using the expression language or the Java API that we provide for ADF security to then look for the possible entry path into that view and protect it from there. Ensure, and that's a hint that we give frequently, that all of the physical pages that you build for an ADF application are saved under the web inf directory. Doesn't necessarily need to be directly under the web inf directory, it could be in a subfolder of the web inf directory. The reason you want to do this is imagine that you're having a bounded task and the bounded task uses page fragments. Now, all of these page fragments require authorization to be accessed, which is defined on the task flow level. So unauthorized users are not allowed to access the, the views. Now, if the physical page is under the public HTML directory, I could just send a GET request and at least get the source of the page. It wouldn't be functional. I can't work with the page, but I can look at the page. I can see if it contains hidden tokens, hidden items, so I can exploit it and then use my knowledge against you. So for that reason, just put it under the web inf and then from a pure GET request, it won't be accessible. For the binding layer, the binding layer protects, and this is what ADF security does, 
automatically every unbounded page, so every page in an unbounded task folder that has a page default associated will be protected by ADF security. However, that's not all that it can do. There's a view or a viewable property on several bindings like attribute value binding that you can use to put in expression language to check against a permission, maybe a permission against a custom resource permission that you build for menu security or for menu security item. Or you check against the accessibility of a specific entity because entities as well, if they're protected with ADF security, can be checked with expression language if the user is allowed to do things. So this will allow you to control the visibility or the updatability of items based on security permissions. One recommendation to give also, and that's more for a design pattern that we introduced in the third recording, and the design pattern is limited view, and limited view with errors basically. Um, if you have an error handler that you customize, then this error handler could contain security aware code. Now, using the Java API for ADF security, I could check the authorization a specific user has. I could have, for instance, have a custom resource permission defined as full view with errors. And if you are granted the permission full view with errors, I would just give you the, the most frank um, view to the exception that occurred and that I just list the full stack trace because I would assume you know how to handle it and you're probably in uh, QA or in support to deal with that. However, if you don't have the permission, I would just strive out all of the um, sensitive information like Java class names or even uh, framework names or framework component names and just give you a user-friendly message that tells you exactly that there is an error but not really why that happens. So you can use a custom error handling. We will have a recording for the architect training purely on error handling, most likely more than one recording, but we will cover how to create a custom error handling and then you will see the methods that are in an error handler and where you could put security then. Well, what I see often is that users have user interfaces that when I work with it, I see a lot of stuff grayed out for me. Uh, menu commands that are grayed out uh, or components that are just grayed out, inactive. And the one thing I'm asking myself here is, um, what do I need to do to um, make this active so that I can see what's under it? And you see that's the first lesson to hack an application. So you don't want to do that. Instead, the recommendation is that just hide components and hide options, many options, many items that users are not supposed to use. When it comes to hiding, the recommendation is to use the rendered property. You can have expression language looking up ADF security for a permission using a, um, on the rendered property and then hide the component if the user is not allowed to see it and show it if the user is allowed. If the user, for instance, is not authenticated, a permission is missing, so specific uh, buttons would be just missing. Once the user is authenticated and has a uh, privileges, those buttons will show. So that's a recommendation, really. Don't gray out components, just hide them. Now, talking about hiding, why not just setting the display hint to full? Because that would hide it as well, right? Well, true, yes. From the obvious look at the page, it's hidden, where in fact it's just a hidden component. So if you have the, the chance to use the render property, do so. The display property just makes it a hidden field in the page, which is less secure, and you don't want to go for that. Input validation, now that's the key of many protection uh, awareness. SQL injection, cross-site scripting, LDAP injection, all kind of depend on the ability to directly input text fields. So here you want to be prepared. You want to make sure that the application is safe. So you want to define secure GOAT gu uh, guidelines, which can be then reviewed by peer reviews so that you're not having any kind of a field that is not checked against the user provided input. One strategy to avoid um, injection would be, for instance, to guide users more closely. Instead of just providing them 10 input text fields, just provide them a minimum set of input text fields and replace the rest with checkboxes, list of values, select lists, radio groups, so that they can only uh, do a choice and they cannot really put free text input field in there. 
Anyway, for all input components, don't trust users and don't trust the entry point if it's not a user, if it's just coming from SOA or wherever. So you always want to make sure that you perform input validation. Use Java surfaces, validators and converters. Converters for text fields to ensure that every user input is encoded so that the JavaScript that they put in is kind of changed so that it displays but doesn't execute. Use managed beans. Um, you can have um, validators defined on a managed bean. You can use out-of-the-box validators. You can write on your, your own validator components. So you have three options here. Just make use of that. Use value change listeners. Whenever there is a change in your data structure and you want to make sure is the user allowed to, to, to perform the change, have a value change listener. And the value change listener always fires before a value is updated. So if you see that a user, for whatever reason, is not allowed to perform the update on, on the component, then just call render response or just show an error message so that the update doesn't happen. On the binding, define validation. The ADF binding layer has the ability for attribute value bindings to define validation, especially if you work against business services that are EGB, that are web services, where we don't have a direct bubbling through of the validation defined on the business service, put this on the binding layer. You can configure that on the data control as well. So you have two options here, the binding layer for one incident and the data control for a central point. You have the full list of validators available that we have available in ADFBC as well. So this is the range validation, regular expression validation, uh, type validation, and you should use that. In ADF business component, just do that on the entity level. Entity validation, I mentioned that. You have three validations that you can perform in ADF business components. You have the entity validation, the entity attribute validation, and you have the transaction validation. Now, the entity validation would be good to compare values if you want to validate if a start date really is before the end date, when it comes, for instance, to a hotel booking. That's a good place to look for that. Uh, you can configure your method validators. This could be written in Java to create more complex business logic driven validation. But always keep in mind validation is not only about business services. Sometimes it's also about security. So you have access to the ADF security context, be it through expression language or Java in this case. And then you have attribute validation. Now that's a typical validation that you have, like is attribute updatable for the user or not? And keep in mind, ADF business components is not a black box. It's just a framework that executes Java objects at runtime. And you can write your own custom classes. You can override the framework behavior. You can look for framework hook points, like execute query for collection, which is always called for a query to put in your security logic in there, even if the security logic is just auditing and logging. So. I mentioned that uh, in this recording, I will help you to think out of the box. Now, so far, we talked a lot about security related features in ADF in Java server faces. But you know, there's a lot more in Java surface and ADF that could be used for security. And this is what I have on this slide here. So first of all, every request that comes in goes to the faces servlet. So I can put in a servlet filter to check security, to check author authorized users. I can try to get an idea of where the request is coming from, if this is an in-house call or if that is an external internet call. Face listeners, they are in the life cycle of a Java Surfaces request. So actually, you can check for when a request comes in, if the user is allowed to do that. And that will give you an option within the Java Surface framework, maybe to redirect to a different page just in case the user is not authorized to access a specific page. Well, if you use ADF security, then <clears throat> typically, if you're not authorized to uh, access a view, we will throw an exception, then your error handler or your exception handler will deal with that. Also, while we have the recommendation to have exception handlers defined for every bounded task law. Bind variables, I mentioned this. It's a good security and protection manner against SQL injection. And uh, it helps you to avoid users, for instance, changing a where clause by just putting in one equals one semicolon and then drop table. Um, so use bind variables, it protects you from that. Custom resource permission, I 
really pointed this out in the third recording on security where I said you can create menu security or semantic security for your application based on JAWS permissions using the resource permission object that we provide for declarative use in the ADF security editor. Here what you can do is something like create a menu security uh, permission and then for this menu security permission you can then use that to define resources which are menu items of course and these menu items will be granted to users and then on the menu itself you can use expression language check against this permission if the user is allowed to work with that you show it otherwise you just hide it and you can use the same expression language or just Java in your business logic then to make sure that if a user clicked on the order command item before you issue for instance the order check if the permission is there if the user is allowed so you double check it that way we do have the ability to use the managed beans view and entity input classes as I mentioned IDF business components is a framework and you can override it so make use of that MDS customization classes we haven't yet talked about customization is one of the next recordings but customization uses Java objects as customization layers and of course I can use that to enforce security however be careful with that because if a specific permission for instance if I'm missing that permission would make MDS to delete sensitive information then a failure in the configuration of MDS would always show the sensitive information so if you use MDS for security for instance for managers to see the salary column what you want to make sure is that the default never shows the salary so that means a permission is required to add the salary column think about what I said in the uh, security design principles where I talked about secure defaults now a secure defaults if you use MDS, MDS with security is that if the MDS artifact is missing in the repository or security fails then the render view should not provide any sensitive information so that's a security fault but you can use MDS personally I would put all of the security related settings into an application and not necessarily into MDS because it's easier to monitor however if you use for instance design time at runtime that everything goes straight into MDS so that a customization class may make sense to have and then you have RDBMS security, label security, virtual private database, proxy users and I recommend make use of this. Always think multi layers of defense. Further readings, there is a paper on ADF security and there are follow up recordings that we have on ADF Insider. Just have a look and um, make sure that you understand which of the security threats really are threatening your application and protect against it. Yeah. So there's nothing more important for security than education and learning.